that there is a God who loves you and has a purpose for your life. Did you know that there is a God who loves you and has a purpose for your life? That is a question that ever since I heard it, I'm like, wow, that is a great opening question. Start a conversation to share with people. And we are doing a series about the elephant questions. What's the big questions people have that stops them from coming to Christ or stops them from understanding God? And we, we've dealt with, or Chuck has dealt with some very big questions people have because those are the questions that people asked him. I think there is an even bigger question that they didn't ask, that the world is asking, that everybody I know in my life has asked once, twice, a thousand times over. How can God love me? You hear that question, and it echoes in your heart, in your minds, in your soul, and says, wow. I've asked that question before. Wow, I've known people who ask that question. Wow, that is the question above all questions is how can God love me? I tell you, I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of reading of people who posted and said, this is, you know, I, I typed that question in and looked for sermons and, and looked for things about how God can love me, how God can choose to love me above everything else. And you know what the question, the answer they get is? They've all boiled it down to a simple phrase. It just does. <laughs> it just does. But why is that question so big? I think every other question that Chuck's, that we mentioned, you know, is the, I call them smoke screen questions, you know? What about the people in Africa who don't get a chance to know? That's a smoke screen question. I want to take you off the topic and put you somewhere else. Can I throw a in? Yeah. They're also big topics. Yeah. This is, you know, what about the, the you know, thousands of millions of people who have heard the word. That's a small well, screen question. Right. This is small. Narrowing it down. And what's the other one that we dealt with? Uh, well, I why do we, why does evil happen in the world? God is love. First John chapter four. We're, we're going to do something that I don't like to do in sermons, and we're going to jump around the scriptures a lot. So first John chapter four. Verses 8 and 10, two peats and three dots. Verses 8 through 10, it says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God is manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. For God is love. People know that verse. We say that all the time. People say, if God, and they use that verse in an if and then situation. If God is a God of love, if God is love, then why does this happen? If this and then does that happening make God still not a God of love? Does something bad happening make God not love? The simple answer to that question is no. No. I think it's because in this world we have a bad understanding of love. I, I don't have to even think that. I know that we have this bad understanding this poor 
understanding of love. And I'm going to put this out there that we will never fully and completely comprehend the enormity, 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 that's not a word. Enormity, that's the word I was looking for. So when you quote me on that, forget all that other part. We will never fully comprehend the enormity, the greatness, the vastness, the complexity of the love and grace of God. We look at grace as that one time enter into the kingdom fee. But it's the grace of God that helps us stand every day of the week. That helps us stand every morning, every minute. That helps forgive us for everything that we've done in the past five minutes. And gives us the strength to continue to move forward. It's the love of God that gives us strength, gives us power, gives us the ability to live. Not just this thing we call the Christian life, but this thing we call life in general. The love of God is intense. It is amazing. It is overwhelming. And did you know that there is a God who loves you and has a purpose for your life? I'm going to say that you get tired of hearing it, I'm going to say it again. So we understand that there is a God who loves us and has a purpose for our lives. Well, here are a couple things that block us from understanding the love of God. Is First of all, we have a hard time loving ourselves. We have an intrinsic knowledge of and we are intrinsically aware of our own unlovability. We're aware of this. One of the things we're going to do today is not only read, well, not only understand the love of God, but I'm also going to take you down what is called the Romans Road in the Book of Romans. Have you ever heard, anybody ever heard that phrase before? Yeah, yeah you're good. Bible school people and Sunday school people, we, we've heard that word, but do we understand how it fits in our lives? The Romans Road, for those of you who don't know, is a way that we can go through the book of Romans and tell people about salvation and tell people about the love of God. And then, oddly enough, it fits in this, well, not oddly enough, it fits with some of these topics that I'm talking about. We are intrinsically aware of our own unlovability. Romans chapter 3, the first stop on the Romans road. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, tells us this. So I'm going to read verse 9. What then? Are, there better than, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. We know that we are not righteous. We know we are not right with God. We are know that we don't live rightly. We know all the wrong things that we do in our lives. You ask me, Herr, what are you good at? I can rattle off one or two things. Um, you ask me, Herr, what are you, what's wrong with your life? Give me about 20, 30 days and we'll have a long conversation. I mean, that's how long it will take me to finish to get to the end of the list. 20, well, maybe not that long, but at least a couple of hours we'll be sitting here talking about what I'm not good at, what I'm, what's wrong with me, where I fail. I can list my failures in an instance, but if you ask me to list my successes, I, I'd be like, well, you know, I'm not, I could. But we know where we fail right? We know what's wrong with us. I know what's wrong with me. You look at yourself in the mirror and you see all your flaws and failures that nobody else in this world even has a clue. And we know we will never measure up. And who are we measuring ourselves up to? Not the Kardashians of this world, but in, in our minds we're measuring this ourselves up to God himself. We know what God expects from us. 
We've known the Ten Commandments, whether we admit them, whether we accept them, whether we want to put them on courthouse lawns or not. We know what they say that, you know, we like, I can't, I've, I've stolen, I've, I've, I've lusted, I've got, I'm horrible with money, I'm horrible with this, I've put other people before you got this, is not it. Well, it's easier for us to realize that there is no good, to think there is no God, than to think there is a God we can't measure up to, because then it's so easy to not love them and not accept his love. And not think that somebody loves us beside, beyond all our faults and failures. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The second rest stop. And it may be a familiar verse to you. If not, this is one that you should memorize because it's one that's memorized in my life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who has sinned and falling short of the glory of God, me. I have sinned, and I have fallen short of the glory of God. Point to me first before I say you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every light one has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How far have we fallen short? <laughs> Extremely short of the glory of God. We're not even close of being in his image or in his realm of perfection. And we understand that. So we have a hard time loving ourselves. So we know our flaws. We know our failures. We know who we are. I'm not saying you have to be like, I'm perfect all the time. I love me. Because then that's another sin called pride. And even if you look underneath all of those people who want to expound upon how great they are, they're only saying that because they know how great they are. The reason why the great Muhammad Ali always said, I am the greatest. I am pretty. I'm the great. You know, because it's secretly inside, it was, he had problems with his own self-image. And he had to pump himself up and tell the world that he was the greatest. Did he truly believe he was the greatest? I think eventually. But there's still part of him that realized he's not as great as he should be. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Another thing that we have problems with is we have never experienced true love from others. The fully complete, I accept you completely, love. There always seems to be something that goes along with it. Something that, that um, makes something that we feel like we have to earn somebody else's love. You ever feel about, like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I feel like I have to do something to earn your love. I have, feel like I have to be the best to earn my parents' love sometimes. Or I have to be a good kid to earn my parents' love. Guys, I don't know what it's truly like yet to have a kid and understand that I love this thing no matter what it does. If it poops on me, throws up on me, yells at me, kicks me, knees me, do whatever, I still love it. I don't fully understand that yet. A lot of you in this room do. I'm looking at the father of twins, the parents of twins back there going, yeah, yes. I've had all, like, I've experienced all of that that he just said. <laughs> I still love the kids. Romans 5, verse 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do we have to clean ourselves up to come to Christ? Do we have to clean ourselves up for God to love us? Do we have to change who we are for God to love us? No. I don't have to change for God to love me. I didn't have to become a super spiritual, clean, pure, holy individual for the love of God to infect my life. God says, here, I love you as you are. While I was still a sinner, 
God loved me. And we've never really experienced that from a human being who says, I love you for everything that you are just because you are. You don't have to change anything. We get people who love us, who want to change us all the time, right? Who, if he just changed that. I think of uh, Jerry Maguire where I love him for the man that he almost is. <laughs> love of God is the point that he just loves us. He just does. He created us. He made us. And he loves us. While we were still sinners. But here's the thing. And in that, the second, this is where we have to stretch some things, but the other thing is we have a hard time loving others. We have a hard time expressing that love to other people, don't we? <laughs> there are some people that are just unlovable. Right? Amen? Anybody want to agree with me on that? There are some people that we just have a hard time expressing that love. And we've never been able to express that love to other people to share with them because we haven't seen it. And then we got this God thing that says share it. And you're like, I don't know if I could do that. Because I don't really love myself, so how can I love other people? You see, it's a pattern. It's all interconnected. It's all interconnected into this sin thing. I'm going to jump to uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. We know that, right? We know that there's a... And, and here's the thing. When people say, why would a loving God send people to hell? My loving God doesn't send people to hell. Sin sends people to hell. The wages of sin is death. There's a punishment for every action. And but you say, but I was still a sinner when God loved me. Yes, but God doesn't want you to stay a sinner. God's love is not total acceptance without change in the future. He'll accept you completely and totally as you are, but his love cuts things out of your life and changes you to what you should be. Because it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift but... The biggest word in that, book, that scripture is but. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's a free gift you didn't earn. That's where there's a whole dust cloud on the face of merit-based religion, doesn't it? Merrick Bates loved, if I do right, you're going to love me. If you do right, you're going to love me. God says, I don't love you because you did right. I love you because I love you. Here's my free gift of grace and love. What do I have to do for it? Nothing is yours. How much does it cost? Nothing for you. It's yours. I already paid the price back in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where I gave my own life for you. gave no life for you. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13. I preached on this a few weeks ago, a few months ago. That is, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For in the heart a person believes, resulting in the righteousness of the mouth, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For all the same, that the Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches. For all who call on him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, we have a hard time understanding how to accept the love of God. And that's 
we have a hard time accepting God's love for us because of all that other stuff. Because we don't love other people. Other people don't love us. We, we don't love ourselves. But God loves us. And he says, all you've got to do is accept it and confess that I am Lord and that I love you and that I'm here for you. And believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and that that love is yours, the love of God is yours. You don't have to do anything for it. You don't have to wonder how God can love you. You don't have to ask, why does God love me? He just does. There is a God who loves you and has a purpose in, for your life. And when you're sitting there saying, well, God, here, that's all great and stuff. And I can live in the love of God. But even those Christians who have lived in the love of God, we don't feel like God loves us all the time because we have, we screw up, we mess up, we do things. And I'm going to give you Romans verse, chapter 8, we're going back, backtrack. Because sometimes we have to backtrack on the trip. And Romans 8 verse 1 says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. If you feel guilt, if you feel remorse, repent, move on, and don't dwell on it. Just go on about your life and God will and draw yourself closer to God. God is not sitting there. We have a view of Zeus when we think of God holding lightning bolts ready to strike us down when we do something wrong. Is this, yeah. We get it from the Greeks. We get it from Zeus. God is not sitting there saying, Ooh, that person just sinned. Shpow! Where's the next one? That person just cussed in church. Shpow! It would make the daily commute a lot easier. Would. But. If he's striking all those other people, wait till he strikes you. You know That's living in a fear of God we're not supposed to be living in. We're supposed to be living in a fear and reverence of God who loves us. Being a God of love does not separate him from being a God of wrath. They're the same thing. It's the same God. And God's only mad not at sinners, but he's mad at sin. He doesn't hate you. He hates what you do. And that you can do that. That can exist. That can happen. You are not what you do. He hates sin. can't fellowship with sin. He said, the wages of sin is death. If you accept my gift of love and grace, the gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Did you know there's a God who loves you and has a purpose for your life? Did you know there's a God who loves you and has a purpose for your life? Do you know? Do you know? God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And He's willing to make everything that we've ever done disappear and justify you to where you it's just like you've never done it. So God loves you. It has a purpose for your life. Today we're going to do something completely different. Something that I don't think has been done in this church in quite a while. And I'm going to open up the altar during this next song. Everybody get the, the band can come on up and, and, and pray and play. Um, we're going to have a moment. I'll get this stuff out of the way. Too. You're going to open up the altar. I'm going to be over here. Chuck's going to come out and join me. And if God is calling you, if, if God is calling you to come to Him today, if you realize that you need to experience this love of God and you need to find Jesus today, come talk to me and Chuck. 
me or Chuck. I don't care who. And we'll and, and and let it make do business with God today. If there's something else that just is on your heart and you need to pray, come on up. We got a nice carpet here on the floor that we've replaced that we put there. Kneel down and pray for you or for somebody else. We're opening up the altar, opening up the floor for you. Let this be the day that changes your life. Let this be the day that you find the love of God. Let's pray. Father God, we do lift up to you this place. Lord, take this moment, take this place and fill your spirit, God. Draw people to you. In Jesus' name. And may we experience the total completeness of your love. In Jesus' name. Amen.